ambition of John King to be Secretary of Education. Dr. King has an impressive credential, an inspiring personal story. I've had the opportunity to meet with him and to discuss his leadership and his view of the law. I share with Dr. King that in the view of many legal experts and, and school officials across the country, the Department of Education has been bullying schools to comply with policies that simply do not have the force of law. This course of use of power, however well-intentioned, is wrong and it's unlawful. Leadership requires making those sure within the department conduct themselves in full compliance with the law. I have an obligation to the people of Oklahoma to ensure that the president's nominees adhere to the law. Regrettably, Dr. King has refused to commit to stopping these regulatory abuses if he were confirmed. For that reason, I will oppose his nomination today. For, part, for far too long, we've witnessed executive overreach in this administration. From the Clean Power Plan to Waters of the United States, federal departments and agencies have us usurped the power to invent law with increasing boldness. The Department of Education overreach is similar in this kind. Instead of promulgating rules that conflict uh, or, or that uh, instead of promulgating rules that conflict with congressional intent, the Department of Education has skirted the rulemaking process altogether by issuing guidance documents they call Dear Colleague Letters. Guidance documents cannot and do not have the force of law. Guidance documents may only interpret existing obligations found in statute or regulation. But some agencies complain that the rulemaking process is too long and requires too much public input so it's easier just to say the new rule simply interprets an existing rule and then skip the compliance with the Administrative Procedures Act that's required for a new rule. It's a complete irony that agencies see regulatory compliance as too burdensome, so they, impo so they impose new regulatory guidance on states, local governments, tribes, and private institutions at a faster pace, and those institutions have no way to fight the rules, only comply. Let me give you an example from the Department of Education's Office of Civil Rights. They have a great responsibility to promote our shared American values of equal opportunity, ensuring gender equality, and work with federally funded schools to prohibit sexual harassment and sexual violence. As a father of two daughters, I fully support the objectives of Title IX and condemn all forms of sexual discrimination. But the Office of Civil Rights Enforcement Authorities that come from Title IX of the, of the Education Department's 1972 bill, those Office of Civil Rights Dear Colleague letters that are now being put out there supposedly notify schools of their obligations under Title IX. But two of the Office of Civil Rights Dear Colleagues letters significantly expand school liability by proscribing policies required neither by Title IX nor by OCR's regulations. I'm particularly concerned with OCR's 2010 Dear Colleague letter on harassment and bullying and the 2011 letter on sexual violence. These letters respectively prohibit conduct and require procedures not required by law. For example, the 2010 letter says that making sexual jokes or distributing sexually explicit pictures or creating emails or websites of a sexual nature can be actionable under Title IX. Well, regardless of what one personally thinks about abhorrent things like what I just described, the First Amendment protects all forms of speech, and no part of our federal government can dictate what is said and not allowed to be said on a university campus. The 2010 letter leaves schools to wonder whether they should police certain speech on their campus or fear a Title IX investigation. The 2011 letter requires schools to change their Title IX um, disciplinary procedures to require a pre, what's called a preponderance of the evidence standard of proof. This means that the, the, the decision maker is 51% sure a student committed an act of sexual assault or sexual violence. But the Office of Civil Rights doesn't require many due process protections for the accused that he or she would enjoy or be provided in a court of law. Office of Civil Rights said it was merely interpreting the equitable resolution standard that's in the law. So it changed and created a new standard saying it's just interpreting some equitable resolution standard that is in the law, a standard that no other administration has ever applied. Now, if these policies had been subject to notice and comment rulemaking, I wouldn't be standing here today. When agencies follow the law, notice and comment 
allows for public input and leads to better regulatory outcomes. The university's never got that chance. So on January the 7th, 2016, I asked the Department of Education a simple question. What text do you derive this new authority you have? Where is it in the law that you created this new policy? Because the Department of Education can't create new law. They can simply promulgate rules from existing law. That's a pretty basic question. Where did it come from in the law? Unfortunately, the Department of Education did not answer my question. They sent me a letter back, but in their response, they insisted that they have the authority to issue guidance under Title IX and cited general ab abilities in the statute. They also cited prior guidance documents, which are also not legal documents. You can't make a new guidance off an old guidance documents. So on March the 4th, 2016, I replied back to them, pointing out that the 2010 and 2011 letters did in fact create new policy. In my reply, I also expressed concern over the Office of Civil Rights and reliance on letters of findings to support their policy requiring the preponderance of evidence standard. But these letters are not binding on other schools either. And in fact, they show that the Office of Civil Rights looks to and has enforced these policies enumerated only in their dear colleague letters across the country. Legal scholars, at Harvard Law and Penn Law have argued that the Office of Civil Rights sexual harassment policy was, get this, here's my quote, inconsistent with the most basic principles we teach. Title IX was not written nor has ever been said to imperil these basic principles as the professors pointed out, which include free speech, due process, and adherence to administrative procedures. To me, this is evidence that the Dear Colleague letters changed the application of Title IX and its regulatory landscape in fundamental ways. These policy changes should be subject to rulemaking process, not just inventing new guidance. Other prominent voices have also stated their concerns with the substance of the matter in which the guidance documents were issued. Take, for example, the director of the Civil Liberties Minded Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, known as FIRE. They stated, OCR has consistently avoided giving real answers to questions about its power to issue regulations outside the bounds of the law. It cannot avoid accountability forever. On this analysis from Inside Higher Ed, a respected news outlet for the post-secondary education community, they said, and I quote, last week the department clarified in a letter, that letter coming back to me, that the Dear Colleague letter acts only as a guidance for college and does not carry the force of law. But many college presidents and lawyers argue that the Department's Office for Civil Rights treats the guidance as far more than a series of recommendations. Instead, they say, OCR uses the letter to determine which colleges are in violation of Title IX and to threaten the federal funding of those that don't follow every suggestion. Some department officials have recently said there are clear musts and clear shoulds in the guidance. The colleges say the Office for Civil Rights does not seem to clearly differentiate between the two. Attempts to clarify which parts of the letter should be read as hard regulations and which should be considered recommendations have only led to more confusion and frustration. That from this well-respected entity. The publication also quotes Terry Hartle of the American Council on Education saying, the department's political leadership can say or write whatever they want, but where the rubber meets the road is where the Office of Civil Rights shows up to investigate cases on campus, and in those cases, they consistently treat every single word of the guidance as an absolute mandate. Ken, Ta Ken Talbert, a lawyer who served as the general counsel at the Department of Education from 2006 until 2009, went on the record to say the response to my letter that I got back from Dr. King and from the Department of, of uh, Education use this. He said, it glossed over concerns regarding whether the department circumvented notice and comment rulemaking. Hans Bader, another former attorney in the Office of Civil Rights, characterized OCR's response as a question-begging rationalization that did not address the criticisms made by many lawyers and law professors. Mr. Bader went further to say the 2011 Dear Colleague letter that was the subject of Senator Lankford's question is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to the Education Department imposing new legal rules out of thin air without codifying them in the Code of Federal Regulations or complying with the notice and comment requirements of the Administrative Procedures Act. 
Commentator George Will penned an op-ed on this same issue of my letter, and he said the department argues its guidance do not have the force of law. It's a distinction without a difference. Last week in my conversations with Dr. King about the Department of Education's practice of issuing guidance in lieu of rulemaking as required by law, he stated that if a school, get this, he stated that if a school has a problem, they can challenge the department in court. Basically saying, if the schools have a problem with our guidance, they can sue us. I believe we're the Office of Civil Rights to take adverse action against a school for failure to, to comply with the guidance documents. If that school fought back in court, I believe that school would prevail. In fact, the legislative and policy director for FIRE said institutions would be on very solid ground in challenging OCR because OCR statements and policies clearly skirted the notice and comment requirements. But you tell me, what school would have the incentive to accept the existential threat that litigation poses to their university when they file suit against the Office of Civil Rights? They risk reputational harm, legal penalties, and rescission of federal funding all because the OCR thinks no one will actually sue them. Many schools decide the risk isn't worth the reward, and the Department of Education knows it. While individual companies or entire industries can and often do fight back against regulatory overreach by the Department of Labor or EPA, the Department of Education positions itself to hold federal funding ransom if universities don't comply with its policies, even when those policies are unlawful abuses of regulatory power. This is unacceptable. Just because we share an objective of equality in school safety doesn't mean we can turn a blind eye to, federal, to a federal department running roughshod over the very regulatory process we require. Here the ends certainly do not justify the means. Schools and the very students we want to protect suffer as a result. Mr. President, I do want to stress that I admire Dr. King's dedication to bettering our nation's schools. All Americans are undoubtedly enriched by contributions made by conscientious and exceptional educators. I thank him for his previous time of service, which is an impressive record. Likewise, I appreciate that these guidance documents predate Dr. King's service in the department and that he had no rule in overseeing their development or issuance. But when I asked him to re-examine them and the process of how they were created, he protected them instead of acknowledging the problem with the process. That tells me there are more Dear Colleague letters coming to our schools, and this agency will continue to make up the rules in a vacuum and threaten federal funding for those who dare not comply. As part of my continued discussions with the Office of Civil Rights, the Department has assured me they will take steps to clarify the interpretive role of guidance, increase its transparency, and enhance opportunity for public input. I'm encouraged that the Office of Civil Rights has committed to these improvements, and I look forward to a continued discussion on how better guidance practices, both within the Office of Civil Rights and across the entire government, can actually occur. Unfortunately, these proposals don't answer the questions that I've asked Dr. King nor do they in any way address the fundamental problems with the 2010 or 2011 Dear Colleague letters or the Office of Civil Rights' broader practice of issuing guidance in lieu of rulemaking. Because I have not received a full answer to the questions I've asked the Department, and because Dr. King does not acknowledge that this overreach is even occurring within the agency he's nominated to lead, I have no choice to oppose his nomination today. Time will tell whether this Department of Education is about to take a new direction with new leadership, or if they will continue the same path of coercive overreach they have already been on. This needs to stop. The American people require a voice into the rulemaking process, and I hope this can press on today. With that, I yield the floor.